Hello, and welcome once again to another episode of Monster Island Radio. My name is Ben, and here's... Graham! (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) I was wondering how you'd react when I did it like that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) My cat didn't like it. Oh, really? (laughs) No. It's a start of them. (laughs) Sorry to all the cats of the world who may be hearing this. (laughs) Um, Before we get started... I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who are listening. Uh, We're away for quite a while, uh, and then when we returned with the previous episode, we got some messages from a a few of you saying you're glad to hear that we're back. And it really was lovely to hear. Yes. And it is, yeah, great to speak to you all. So, uh, again, thank you for reaching out. Very grateful. Um, So, what are we doing today? Today, we're talking about Kong Skull Island. Yes. Yep. Released in 2017. Uh, so this is essentially a reboot of King Kong, um, which has had you know, a few iterations mm. over the years. But most importantly to us, uh, it was tied to the you know, Toho Godzilla universe in 1962 with King Kong versus Godzilla. And the then third Godzilla movie. The third Godzilla movie. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes, the third Godzilla movie. <laughs> <laughs> in the original run, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it had a sequel, King Kong Escapes, in 1967. Oh, yes. Um, well, there, there's, a, there's a robot Kong in that one. There is, yeah. I've not seen that one. I've got it on DVD somewhere. and yeah. Mm. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm okay. sure we'll, we'll do that one one day. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, so, yeah, but now this film's come out and this one's now tied to the uh, legendary MonsterVerse. So, uh, yeah, what happened? Well, let's have a little rundown. Uh, so we open with two pilots mid dogfight crashing their planes somewhere in the South Pacific in 1944. Uh, they continue to fight on the island until we see a tease of Kong inhabiting the island, and then you know it cuts away. Uh, and then similarly to Godzilla 2014, we get like a newsreel montage uh, of the years gone by from 1944 until we land in 1973 where we see Bill Rander and Houston Brooks from Monarch secure some funding for an expedition to the only uncharted island on the planet. It's Skull Island. They gather together a bunch of scientists and military to get them to the island so they can chart and examine it and hopefully find a Muto. So Muto in this sense, back then it wasn't referring to the Muto from Godzilla 2014. It's just the catch-all term for Mm. any big creatures, basically. And crucially, like the monarch guys have a strong uh, idea that something's going to be there, but none of the other people they drag along are aware. Exactly. Yeah. Um, So once they do get to the island, they're greeted by a Kong who takes down their helicopters, leaving the survivors scattered. So we're left with two groups, essentially, by this point. They need to rendezvous and escape from the island together. Uh, One group is led by Conrad, the former SAS tracker. And they, they run into a native tribe there called the Iwi. And they also run into Marlow, who is the American pilot we saw at the beginning who crashed his plane. Uh, we learn that Marlow and Gunpei, the other pilot, ended up becoming like brothers when they realize there's no reason to fight when they're away from civilization. Um, he explains that Kong is there to protect the island from the skull crawlers, and he's the last of his kind. So they plan to get to the coast of the island for their pickup using an old modified jet as a boat and rendezvous with the other team. Actually, the director, Jordan Vogt Roberts, um, mm-hmm. he's writing an upcoming Metal Gear Solid film. Oh, yeah. And the boat's called Grey Fox. And I wonder oh, if that's a reference there. No so, question. Yeah, it's got to be right. Yeah. Um, uh, and the other team is led by Colonel Packard, who is like insanely angry at Kong for killing his men and swears revenge on Kong. And... Um, and he doesn't care that you know he's protecting the island, despite what Conrad's team told him. He's more concerned with killing Kong out of revenge than leaving the island at all. Really. Absolutely, yeah. So he's yeah. putting everybody in danger. So. Yeah. Uh, so he plans to kill Kong using the remaining seismic charges from the expedition, but his own team turn against him because they too have realised that Kong is not the enemy. And then just as Packard intends to detonate, the rest of the team manage to escape, as the skull crawlers start coming towards them, and then Kong crushes him before he can hit the trigger. 
So the crew managed to get to the rendezvous point as Kong manages to take out the last skull crawler, the big one, Ramorak. Uh, and then, you know, they get away. Everyone's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Godzilla 2014 was good, but not great, in our mm. opinion. So... Was, very, very high peaks and very, very low valleys, basically. Ex- exactly. So it left it quite middling mm-hmm. overall. Um, so I was definitely... I had some cautious optimism going in with this one. Uh, I mean, how did you feel about it when, when we were going in? I Well, I didn't see this one in the cinema. Let's put it that way. I wanted oh, you know? to, but I never got around to it. I had the full intention of going, but things got in the way back then and... You know, I have no memory of why I didn't go, but I just missed it in the cinema. Yeah, which I think says a lot about my overall like enthusiasm for it. That like I, you know, I felt quite excited, but then it ultimately didn't bother really. So right. I've only ever seen it on streaming. I've watched it on streaming when it first came to Amazon, and I watched it again last night for this. Obviously, mm. when I f- first saw it, I thought it was fine, a uh, good fun movie, but not particularly well put together. And then last night, I found myself enjoying it quite a lot. And I think it would probably be easily the best of the current three um, MonsterVerse movies. Mm, I noticed each time I've seen it as well, I've enjoyed it more each time. Mm. Which is strange, isn't it? Like, consi- <laughs> considering what we said about 2014, it had the exact opposite effect. I still think this is a clumsy movie and there's, th- there's lots and lots of problems with it. But ultimately, and we'll get into this in the final detail, but it does give you what you what you want. It does what it says on the tin at the end yeah. of the day. So it's yeah. not like fine art or anything. I mean, there's better King Kong movies, even though there's a lot of bad King Kong movies. But yeah. Um, yeah, so my feeling when it came out was that I was sort of lukewarm kind of level of excitement. Didn't end up seeing it for a good 12 months after it released. And then I've kind of been, I've warmed to it over time, I think, more and more. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, Max Borenstein again, who's the writer. Uh, so he's been involved with all the movies in some mm. way as part of the MonsterVerse. Um, and he wrote Godzilla Awakening as well, the comic. Um, right. So I do wonder whether he listened to the criticism of Godzilla 2014. Because, I mean, this one is much lighter in tone. And, you know, like you got you got things like, you know, the... Jurassic Park references, like with Sam Jackson saying, hold on to your butts. And John C. Riley has that um, writing on on the back of his jacket saying, you know, good for your health, which is a reference to his character, Dr. Steve Brawl. And it's like, it's kind of like silly little funny things. So it's like, it's so much lighter in tone. And I do wonder whether Borenstein had kind of gone, yeah, maybe we need to make this a little bit lighter, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the setup for this is quite... It's not overly complex, but you got like the ragtag gang uh, from Monarch, you know, because they're on their last legs until they find Kong and basically proving his existence, proves yeah, their worth. This is like their, their last shot of getting like any kind of financing and continuing to, to exist as a entity in the government. Exactly. Um, and you have this whole science versus military kind of theme permeating through the whole film. It's, mm. a, you know, it's kind of tropey, but I think it, it always serves as a great source of conflict. Um, cause like in day of the dead, which I'm, have you seen day of the dead? I can't remember. I haven't. No, I, I've, you know, I, I know it kind of thing. Yeah. But, yeah. So there you have both the army and scientists yeah. and they're, they're essentially trapped in this bunker together and there's a constant power struggle. And I think that makes for great tension, but I mean, in this case, you know, Kong and the skull crawlers are the zombies. So, <laughs> I mean, that's really what this film is. It's kind of like day of the dead crossed the Jurassic park in my opinion. Um, and it's kind of, I suppose this is kind of what Aliens was to Alien. I guess well. so. You get more, you know, lighter tone, more militaristic tone than the previous movie and yeah, more action. I guess, yeah, there could be a parallel there. Yeah. I mean, there's, um, you know what, because I th- actually, maybe that's not a good comparison because I think of Alien as quite suspenseful mm. and horror themed. Whereas, I mean, this this probably had better horror <laughs> than Godzilla 2014 had. I mean, you had that, that bit with the big mother long legs with, the, with the, <laughs> the leg through the face kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only other time I could think of such nasty horror moments in Godzilla was in Megaguirus uh, versus Megaguirus, you know, with that oh, yeah. me- Mega Nulon kind of punched a hole through that guy's face. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think the p- comparison does like stand up though, because regardless of how successful the movies are in Alien and in Godzilla 2014, you have a you know more kind of slow, creepy approach to it with mm-hmm. little fleeting glimpses of your monster. Obviously, we 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 think about Alien is it's good at it and Godzilla perhaps not so much and then in this one I think you're right that the writing team and the overall production team have probably responded to the reservations that Godzilla had as a movie and the the fans response to that decided oh we need to actually go full force Uh, I wouldn't lay the tone or the the amount of Godzilla we'd get in 2014 purely at the writer's footsteps uh, at his feet either because um, I think it's it's the overall production and the budget of that movie and the tone that they've chosen to go with, which dictate that to a large degree. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a seismic shift from the entire kind of like the legendary Toho team that are working on this MonsterVerse probably thought, oh, actually, people want to see monsters. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's easier to put Kong on film than Godzilla. Like, is it cheaper or less taxing in some way? But Maybe. you see, a, you see a, like at least twice as much Kong as you do Godzilla in that movie comparatively. So, yeah, easily. I mean, well, I wonder if it's because of his environment as well. Maybe because you, I guess you don't have to have CG buildings crashing down. You know? Yeah, because they filmed on location in Vietnam. Yeah, they? so like he's got big open spaces for him. So maybe, yeah, maybe that is part of it. I hadn't actually considered that. What but, do you do? You put any stock in this like Vietnam War parable that some see in the movie, and I think I think it's there to a degree in the screenplay. Uh, it's not especially strong, um, but it, 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 it's I don't see it as a failed thing either. I think it's something that they touch upon. It's by no means supposed to be the core of the movie. It's just sort of there. I but feel I like s- it's just sort of there. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I suppose some people might feel that commenting on something in such a glib way, you know. Is just devaluing bad taste. Yeah, not yeah. a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, it's not so imposing that it spoils the movie. No, me. it just feels like more more like acknowledging it than anything else. It seems like they've chosen that kind of era as a style more than like as a political comment in a way. I yeah, I would agree actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess you could argue that's a little bit irres- disrespectful or <laughs> irresponsible, but I don't. You know. I don't think it's too bad, personally. I mean, something I, I dislike about this in terms of the Samuel L. Jackson character. Um, what's that? Is it Colonel Kirk Jackson? Colonel, Colonel Packard. Packard, yeah. This guy's basically got PTSD, right? He's he's not so much, in my opinion, he's not so much driven crazy by Kong as he is driven crazy by his overall career experiences that he's mm-hmm. sort of touched upon in the early part of the movie. You see him in his office when he's about to discharge from Vietnam where they're abandoning this conflict and he's dejected by it he feels like he's not achieved anything on an individual level or like a grand like statesman kind of level I just feel like I don't have a strong feeling about this so I don't want to overstate it but they do kind of hijack his PTSD to make him the villain and I don't know if that's entirely like a great thing to do in the modern era of movie making the way that we approach like mental illness effectively these days yeah. like it's a cartoony thing and i get the tone of the movie is more comic booky and more popcorny and it, you know you probably shouldn't think about it too deeply but i think that that kind of is the what they're doing this guy's damaged from his experiences in the war and he becomes like the antagonist of the whole movie and i suppose I, you could say like well that's just a uh, cautionary tale to not get involved in unnecessary unnecessary conflicts which i do think actually is another part of the movie that's actually very strong so mm. i guess you could come at it from either direction yeah i don't know is it a ptsd or is it because i'm not sure what his kind of motivations were for you know getting everyone like they just finished fighting to then get them start fighting again i guess well he's he's requested to to you know um, what's the word? He wants to. He needs to chaperone these scientists. Yeah, his yeah. island, and he just volunteers his team. He, he's he's asked to do it. He doesn't volunteer. Sorry, they mm. ask him to mm. go, so he just does. And then it's the monarch people who tell him to drop those charges, which ultimately enrage Kong and get all these people killed. Yeah. And this is another thing which I commented on Godzilla 2014, where monarch as an entity does something bad and don't really have any repercussions for it. In 2014, they basically keep all the kaiju's secret to the detriment of human, you know, of humankind. Yeah. And then in this movie, they enrage Kong. It gets a bunch of soldiers killed, and 
there isn't really any particular anger or aggression directed at like John Goodman or the other monarch cast it's, members in it's this. It's weird how much they can get away with and yeah. you're supposed to sympathise with them most. And it's like the movie wants Samuel L. Jackson to be the villain. Packard is the villain because he goes a bit nuts and I'm like that's fine, that's just, you know, take it from either direction whether it's good or bad. I think there's a lot to be said for it. Mm. Um, but, you know, really John Goodman is the villain of the movie, right? <laughs> so I suppose so. So yeah, um, so yeah, who have we got in this? We've got Sam Jackson as Packard. John Goodman as Bill Rander, uh, Brie Larson as Weaver, who's the photojournalist who figured something was up. Tags along. Tags along. Nobody's um, bothered that a journalist is there at it's all, really. quite strange. Um, Tom Hiddleston as Conrad, former SAS. John C. Riley as Marlowe. And actually, special shout out to Miyavi, who was Gunpei at the start. Um, so I need to let my sister know because she's obsessed with him. She's a fan, shall she's, we say. She's a big fan. Um, <laughs> I hate him because he's really good looking. He's incredible <laughs> on guitar. <laughs> and now he's part of the Monsterverse. I have to know who this guy is. Uh, That's kind uh, of my favourite part of the movie, though, honestly. is, is that really good. bit yeah. when this Japanese pilot and the American pilot land and they continue to fight until they see Kong. And to me, it's like, yeah, it's the start of the movie, but the messaging is kind of encapsulated very quickly and sort of done with almost too fast, where it's mm. like men mankind can have these inter you know they can have this infighting basically these pointless conflicts people are dying uh, for needless reasons and kong represents like the the higher threat of, of maybe like environmental factors like you know that, that man should look forward to um you know a mutual threat that they can protect themselves from so mm. it, that's what stops the Japanese guy and the American guy fighting is that they realise they have a common cause suddenly in, yeah. in getting away from Kong and it, it breaks up their conflict. So I think that's quite a strong symbolism in yeah. that opening sequence and it's almost like too strong for the rest of the movie. Like it should come later <laughs> nearly. Almost they could have done that as a flashback or something. That would be good, yeah. You, you could also argue that the Japanese guy and the American guy fighting at the beginning is sort of foreshadowing Kong versus Godzilla as a movie as well. I suppose so, yeah. It felt like more of an ensemble cast rather than kind of having one or two main protagonists. Because mm. um, I suppose they kind of set it up in a way that Conrad and Weaver, who are probably the most removed from the situation, um, and I think they're kind of intended to be the two leads that we sympathise with most. Um, but I do feel like overall there was enough shine on the majority of the whole cast. You know, kind of gave it a team vibe. Um, actually, with some exceptions which I'll get onto in a second because not everyone got a spotlight. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's kind of like, you know, there's, there's there's ideas to get behind. I mean, yeah, you've got reasons for everyone being there. Like, Randall wants to be there. Well, he's part of Monarch because his ship, the um, USS Lawton, was mm. sunk by an unknown Muto in 1943. Which supposed you know, to assume it's Godzilla, it's Godzilla right, right? I, think, I yeah. think that's the idea. I mean, they never explicitly said it could be something completely different. Yeah, you know, they could go and wreck on these things if they wanted to, but I assume it's Godzilla. Um, uh, yeah, you got Conrad there, who was a tracker. I mean, he's only there for the cash, really. Weaver, the photojournalist, so she wants to get a scoop. Um, and yeah, then you got the military and the and the science team but yeah there's two two characters that i feel barely got a mention who are pretty important and that's san lynn and houston brooks mm -hmm. so they're the two scientists of the monarch and i mean they're essentially the reason why they're all on the island but they basically play background for the entire film and apparently the chinese have like chinese audiences and critics have a term uh, a derogatory term which is like flower vase or just vase which is for asian actors who have been cast as little more than set dressing essentially mm -hmm. and i think that's a big letdown for the film because it has such a diverse cast for it to fall into these trappings of you know having minorities just there to tick some boxes i feel was quite disappointing um apparently they had bigger parts that were cut which is fair enough because you want to kind of maintain the momentum you know you don't want to get bogged down in too much you know extra story and stuff like yeah. that considering it's kind of like an action film but it's still disappointing um Actually, Houston had he had a bigger part throughout the MonsterVerse overall, which I'll, I'll get onto a bit later. So you know, it's not all lost. And the thing with having like this diverse cast, I really liked that, but I do feel like they could have explored some of the difficulties they 
would have faced like in the 70s and i'm kind of conflicted because it's i like to see a diverse cast where their race doesn't matter because you know it's a fun movie it shouldn't matter Mm -hmm. but at the same time i do feel like it kind of does it a bit injustice does does them injustice sorry um so you know the tribulations they would have faced in that era i mean that's not an issue i'm nearly qualified enough to talk about Mm. but you know it was definitely played on my mind a little um i you know i know i'd love to live in a, a candy land where everyone gets along so you know this this film kind of fits the bill but yeah i don't know yeah it's a very complicated subject that because some movies comment on you know those racial issues from even the present day um mm. which unfortunately still exist and some movies whether you agree with it or not they do just try to kind of ignore it and, and provide a level of diversity to you and level of representation which is in itself important um but yeah i th- i think um the whole movie actually suffers from a a bloated cast and i know that they're going for this ensemble thing they've done quite well with with who they've cast everybody in it is and m- most of them are known actors and very good actors it's um, quite strange for me because i normally don't care who's on a film hmm. but even i have to say like i think the cast they actually managed to pull together was pretty good for this Exactly, but there's just too many of them for, for my liking, and not they don't as uh, they don't feel like an ensemble so much to me. Um, no. They don't think I don't think the cast like gels together that well, or feels like they they don't bounce each other in in a very interesting way. And ultimately, I I think you could probably have a couple fewer characters and then embellish the ones who are left over a bit more. Um, John C. Riley, who's the American pilot who's like lived on Skull Island for like thirty years, is by far the most interesting one. Yeah, I think. Um, and Brie Larson and Tommy Dustin do a great job of what they're given uh, in their performances, but you just don't feel like that connected to them. And I think um, the Brie Larson character suffers a similar fate as the the Brody character for the Brody character from Godzilla 2014. Um, uh, yeah, go Aaron on. Aaron Taylor Johnson. Yeah, yeah. He plays this. Um, he plays a demolition. He's like a bomb disposal guy. He's going to defuse a bomb, as I said in the previous podcast. He spends the whole movie building up to the, the time where he's going to defuse a nuclear bomb, and the movie 2014 ends with him being unable to do that, and he basically doesn't achieve anything in the whole movie. Yeah, Brie Larson's one of the stronger characters in Skull Island, but she's a photojournalist, so you would think the movie would would conclude with some sort of cliffhanger or reveal that the photographs she's taken are going to have a big impact on the monsterverse going forward. Yeah, and, I but she that. takes all these pictures, and I think by the end she's just like. <laughs> they don't really come to anything yeah. and ultimately she's she's just there as like the girl she's the Anne Darrow to this movie you know from the original King Kong like you know, they need a blonde lady for Kong to interact with in one scene mm. and although I think Brie Larson does a really great job in this movie like that is really the only reason she's there which is kind of like okay yeah Kong blonde ladies this is a this is a trope that exists in every single Kong movie and it's a shame really because I think the idea that she's taking these pictures and what becomes of those pictures should have like a domino effect in MonsterVerse. Um, and that's the thing I think that makes MonsterVerse feel more like a set of connected sequels that just go on in, in a linear line compared to, say, the MCU, which obviously has Brie Larson in there as well. MCU movies you can watch in a v- variety of different orders and things pop up in one movie and they it's not cyclical kind of thing. Mm. You can you can look at things in, in different ways. It's non-linear is what I should say, more or less, with the, the connections that are made. But with the MonsterVerse, I think you can watch one, two, three, four movies in a row and that is the way they're intended to be watched because there's never really any kind of... There's no cause and effect storytelling, really. It's just one little popcorn movie to the next, which I think is a shame overall. Because of the times they're set in, we're not going to see like the Brie Larson come back in Godzilla vs. Kong because she'll be a lot older. Maybe they'll recast her as a different actress. Mm. But what I'm saying is like the characters are good, but they're not leaving an impression on it as a franchise. Um, I guess you'd say, like, well, Kong and Godzilla are the stars of this, so that's what really matters. And I think that's absolutely true, to be honest with you. But it's a shame when you see a good character performed by a good actor and then you move on to the next move and it's like well they didn't leave anything behind really yeah yeah i i would agree actually uh, because my assumption was we would never see any of these people again once it finished yeah and yeah because they they were strong characters and it's like yeah they, they've we enjoyed spending time with them but yeah we already presume they're not coming back and then also don't really care that they're not coming back i suppose because just like that's just the that's the that's what they've established. The producers of these movies have established that you get, you know, you feature in a movie, we want the next one, and they're gone. 
and that's well, like it really what's kind of strange though is there is one character and that's brooks and he's appeared like oh, yeah. several times over now so he's in he's basically in all the comics and he's in king of the monsters as well he's at the mothra cocoon that's site. right yeah i remember that yeah, yeah. so yeah. which is why it's so weird that he essentially just has a bit part in this it seems that's like the, the, he's almost kind of the glue for the monster verse but like he's, really subtly yeah he's so ancillary though it's like i remember mm. we talked about it after seeing king of monsters like oh that guy you know that black scientist guy was in it from kong skull island and i was just like oh was he like it makes Al- no almost difference no impact yeah yeah it's, it's, it's not strange. like when nick fury turns up in multiple marvel movies and that's the linchpin it's just like oh shit these things are like locking together it's like I, there isn't yeah i wonder if that's what they're trying to do but just don't know how to do it well maybe they're trying to be subtle and they're being way way too subtle with it well that's the thing as well as like with mcu when you when samuel L. jackson walks onto the screen you take notice yeah uh, absolutely and there's just a whole level of character that comes with the actor and i'm not saying like you need to cast a star for this role but when you want an interconnecting character we've got to notice them for one reason or another whatever mm-hmm. it may be yeah yeah <laughs> uh so the monsters in this film yeah the the monsters are the real stars so I guess they, we could. they are the real stars so we've got kong obviously so now with kong like well, you know well godzilla he's he's like a sympathetic force of nature which i've probably said a million times now mm. but there's always a, a disconnect with him i find because he is essentially a force you know he's he's you know, you don't, you wouldn't communicate with him as such. But Kong is much warmer and more empathetic mm. and almost more of a character as such because there's some level of com- you know, communication with him. And I think that's the kind of fundamental difference between him and Godzilla that stops him just being another big monster. Yes. You know, I mean, he's he's fearsome, yeah. Um, but you do feel that he's a you know, protector more than anything else, which is 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 the main thing about Kong. Um and like there's that scene where um is it chapman he's he's by Mm -hmm. the water and like kong's bathing his wounds yeah and he catches that squid and i presume kong sees him there but he doesn't give a shit because you know he's not a threat as such there seems to be some eye contact just before kong walks away again yeah yeah Uh, you know he's, he's not there just to crush humans getting on with you know just getting on with his own thing so um which is like which is nice to see again like it's they're not making him out to be a monster, you know, an an evil thing. So I think the way that's where the monsterverse I think has been really good. You never ever feel like they're enemies, except for obviously King of the Monsters, where you got King Ghidorah, who is yeah. obviously the big bad. All of them have a personality. With Ghidorah being villainous, that's his thing. Mm. And then I think with Godzilla, there's, there's words you could associate with him where he's he's powerful like formidable he's more like a a bodyguard almost of the world um he's fearless in himself like godzilla as a character there's a lot you could apply to him in terms of like a heroic character and also a character that you ought to be fearful of because he's very dangerous and not necessarily completely predictable Mm. kong there's more of a sorrow like a pitying factor attached to kong because in his original movie the 1933 one He's captured against his will. He's put into a situation that he has no control over. He's killed in New York City. And it's just like, that's a totally different thing. So yeah, they are so separate. And in a way, they don't really have... We use the word personality to to apply to these monsters, but really it's more of a overall tone or a vibe or like a yeah. a message they, they portray because yeah. they're just like big creatures. So, you know, I, I don't think they... It's not that you see the emotion in Godzilla's face or anything so much as you get the impression through the filmmaking. Mm. Uh, King Kong has always been about who's the real monster, effectively, and usually in Kong movies, some more saccharine than, than others. It's like man is the real monster, and you know this massive, dangerous ape is like this thing that should just be left alone. He represents like nature and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Godzilla is like a totally different thing, where he represents nature to some degree, but it's it's a it's a fighting power rather than a defensive power one is offensive one is defensive i mm. think yeah they're, they're like a i wouldn't go as far to say they're two sides of the same coin at all 
but they they are used to symbolize different things i think yeah. entirely yeah uh, and we've got the skull crawlers in this mm. um and i love them because i mainly because of their design because uh, they're really striking to look at mm. and they're really threatening looking and you know my issues with the mutos in 2014 was that they were dull but even without the skull crawlers having colors they're still me- memorable to look at like with the skull patterning on their faces and you know just the two limbs and a big tail yeah it looks as though they've evolved a more fortified head like skull element of their body to yeah. protect against kong yeah kind of exactly and it's kind of like um you know like uh in um silence of the lambs that that hawk moth that has the skull on its back and it's that kind of thing where well because the skull crawlers their eyes aren't actually in the sockets of the skull they're like moved back a bit they're they're further back yeah so it's this kind of like evolution of self-defense i suppose yeah Um, brie larson like shoots a flare into one of their eyes like flawlessly on the first attempt so it's not like it's not the the eyes aren't hard to locate but they're definitely not like inside the skull per se Mm. um and like yeah you got like a bunch of other creatures as well um yeah they sort of give you the impression that skull island is like drenched in some sort of like I don't know. I wouldn't say it's like a chemical or like an atmosphere or like a spiritualism, but things get big there. It's the thing, right? Yeah, and I'm not really sure why, because they have like they. This is the film where they touch on the Hollow Earth theory, and I mean we don't really know that much about the theory as such, other than the fact that they can traverse the planet through these through these tunnels, and also that's where titans seem to come from and i think the idea is that um skull island is kind of like um it's kind of like madagascar you know because yeah. like you like you got that weather system around it which leaves it untouched and that's why that's well, that's not why madagascar was untouched i think it's because <laughs> no one knew it was there for a long time um, but as a result you kind of get this well on madagascar you have this thing called convergent evolution mm. so like for example there's um an animal called a, a tenek which looks like a hedgehog but it's actually closer to an elephant than it is a hedgehog. But because of its environment, that's how it's evolved. And I think that's kind of the idea they're going for with um, Skull Island. You know, it's this mm. sort of, actually, maybe it's more of a divergent thing, you know, like that water buffalo is huge, but then it's partly amphibious, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's this completely untouched place. But then is it that is it that they're coming from this, from the hollow earth? Or is it that, yeah, like what you're saying, is it something that's dousing this island that's making them big? Or are things coming from the hollow earth through that opening? And then as a knock-on effect, creatures that live on this isolated island have evolved to To cope. defend themselves, yes. Yeah, so that's why they're big, really. It's not to do with any sort of chemical or atmosphere thing. I think that's it then. Mm. That makes sense. And effectively, is Skull Island not the equivalency of Monster Island in this version? And that's something else I thought. I don't know. Are I mean, we Sc- going to have to change the name of this podcast? <laughs> Potentially. Because, <laughs> well, actually, in the Godzilla Awakening comic, there is an island called Monster Island. Oh. So M-O-A-N-S-T-A. So I didn't mention that in the last episode. But yeah, I suppose that's the Monster Island. Monster Island. No, haven't they cake and eaten it to some extent? Though. Yeah, I think so. Um, just going back to Kong for a second. Yeah. I was going to talk about his design, but I mean, it's a gorilla. <laughs> well, there's, there's only so many ways to skin a cat, really. But if you look at the Peter Jackson Godzilla, sorry, the Peter Jackson Kong, for example, mm. totally different. So... You know what? I've never seen it. You've seen pictures, I assume, right? Yeah, it looked the same, <laughs> roughly. I think the 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 Kong in, in Peter Jackson's remake is much more gorilla inspired, whereas Kong in Skull Island is is more of a general ape sort of look. Uh, right. If, if anything, this one's a bit closer to the original 1933 version of Kong, just done in in CG. Um, yeah. Whereas I think they aimed to, for for Peter Jackson's version to be a little bit more realistic and grounded. But yeah, I think the design's good, and and it's not readily apparent in the movie, although they, they do mention it eventually. But when you know that he's supposed to be a bit younger, adolescent, not fully grown, it does make sense. He's you know he's a bit more um, saturated in his fur color. He's got like kind of a more kind of 
uh, immature face, I think, compared to some of the other Kongs. And now that mm. we've seen trailer footage of Kong, how he looks in the next movie, they've obviously aged him up with more of like a, almost like a haggard, almost like bearded face in some ways. That is just how he's kind of progressed over the last 30 years within the story. Yeah. So yeah, I think the design, there's more to be said for it. Um, I suppose so, because yeah, I, uh, from what I remember of the Peter Jackson one, it was more kind of like a silverback exactly. gorilla sort of look. But yeah. I suppose with this design, it makes him, maybe it's better for fight scenes as well. To have a kind of more, uh, more manlike, almost. more manlike, yeah, exactly. Because um, uh, I mean, if, if just talk about the fights for a second, because they were still they were really fast, but still had like real weight behind them and felt really tactile. Yeah, and they do a good job of showing you, even preemptively before we knew that the the versus movie was coming, that that Kong and Godzilla fight in very very different ways, mm. different levels of intelligence, different different approaches to combat. Um, Godzilla's more instinctual, I think, and like I've got my fire breath, I've got my fists, he gets in, and and they fight very brutally. Whereas Kong, obviously, we see him using tools and picks up picks up trees and makes you know defensive items for himself where he's more he's yeah. more intelligent and, he, and he's faster yeah so he may not be as strong as, as godzilla but he's he's adapting more so yeah um because the fight scenes were like i really really enjoyed that i suppose there's only kind of really one big there's, fight scene was right at the end i guess so it's one monster fight and then i guess you could count the helicopter scene there in the beginning as like a fight in a way Mm. but not really um yeah yeah but yeah that final fight i yeah i really enjoyed that i was like i like the uh because i think there are lots of callbacks in this i don't know whether you find them a bit cheesy but i quite like them so like you know when when he's fighting that that big skull crawler at the end he's he falls back into the water and gets wrapped in the chains mm-hmm. i liked that because I s- assume that was a reference to, like, you know, the original, like, 1933 and Yeah, that, it's like you know. Kong iconography is being worked in. Yeah, but then yeah. Like, he, he ends up, you know, breaking the chains and using it as a weapon, mm-hmm. which I thought was kind of really cool. I don't know if you probably thought it was lame, but I like that kind of stuff. No, to me, I mean, a, a lot of this movie is, like, quote-unquote lame, honestly. I think some things do fall flat, but not, not in, in a big enough way for me to dislike it significantly. Yeah, you weren't so keen on the... You know, having him pick up Weaver kind of thing. That's, yeah, the, that's the, the only one that I really find a bit like. It's only there because Kong. The change mm. thing is more subtle. I, I thought the same thing as you watching it, but I don't think it's so obvious and in your face. But when, you know, they just stick a, a girl there to, you know, be picked up by Kong and just like because they want to tick a box off, basically that somebody feels that's necessary for Kong's characteristic I get that it does actually work for this Monsterverse franchise because as we've seen in the next movie that's you know he's going to have a more of a connection with humans and you know have a closer relationship a more intellectual relationship as I said with like actual people and be able to communicate with people so to see him actually fishing Brie Larson out and saving her that's not a bad thing but there is an element of just like oh we need the and arrow thing there because that's Kong the whole mm. thing where he's like he puts his hand down like the skull crawler's throat and like pulls its entire <laughs> body outside of itself and he's he's got her inside his hand at the same time i said to my fiance when we were watching it like um let me pull your arm as hard as i can in in the opposite direction to you and put like a what's it or like some crisps in your hand and see if you don't crush them as i fight you sort oh, of thing. right yeah and it's like she would be so dead <laughs> but i assume the what's it is no more we didn't try it but it goes yeah. <laughs> you know but um yeah so i don't mind it even as an action thing as a silly thing like she would die 100 percent. that's not really what bothers me that's like they do cool things like the chains it's the best example as you mentioned and then there's the other end of the spectrum which is like kong needs to interact with a lady and i think it's a bit reductive especially when brie larson's doing quite a lot of you know, heavy lifting with the the small role she's been given. Mm. Like, there's a scene where she cries when she first sees Kong face to face. It's just like it, the effects in this movie are generally really, really good. Um, but that shot in particular, like the eye lines, aren't matched up that well at all. And it kind of betrays <laughs> her performance because she's like she's acting against nothing. There's no Kong there yeah. at all. You know, in the 1976 remake of Kong, they made a huge Kong. Um, animatronic that you could you could perform against it looks terrible 
Um, we're going to watch that one at some point. Uh, but for Brie Larson, she's literally shedding tears as she sees this thing, but she's not seeing any of it. So to think that in the in the effects house they couldn't get the eye lines matched up, I'm just like, you know, that's weird because I mean he was added after after the fact. Surely you just shift it up uh, or down, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, visually, I th- I thought the whole film looked great. I mean, it had like this kind mm. of nice, you know, we're saying like that, you know, Vietnam kind of genre film kind of color grading and things Topical like look yeah. yeah i thought it looked really good um it was yeah very pushing really hard to look a certain way and sound a certain way especially with like the music choices that they had as well like mm-hmm. you know reminiscent of that that era some are a bit too obvious yeah i mean i don't mind because i love credence so having run through the jungle and bad moon rising playing you know, that's 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 no bad thing in my opinion. Those were less obvious choices. I felt those were good ones, but when they put in what is it that one? What the Dormouse said, this is a, a an incredible song that is so overused to mm. rep, to represent the seventies, and I think and that paranoid play, as well. Yeah, playing music to tell you that you're in a certain era is quite a. It's a bit of a crutch in movie making. I think mm. that there are, there are other ways you can go about it, but it's so easy just to stick a track on and be like, "Oh, it's this time." Remember this song? Yeah, yeah. So, definitely. but this this is the thing with, with this whole movie is that it's not Godzilla twenty fourteen seems to have a, a a visual ambition to be quite lofty, I think, and very artistic, and it is at times, which we enjoyed. This movie abandons that that grounded realism to quite a strong degree. And because of that, I'm willing to forgive its more kind of popcorny elements, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I agree. I think all of that's intentional. Exactly. Yeah. Speaking about the music, actually, the like, so I suppose having those kind of popular tracks could kind of downplay the score a little bit, which was really, really good. It's quite subtle. So, the, you know, the, there's one piece of music in particular um so the composer is henry jackman but there's one piece of music called packard's blues which mm. is kind of the kind of brief musical cue for any of packard's scenes and it's essentially acted as the bad guy music to some extent and it's just this kind of um it's like delayed guitar sound with some kind of you know, swelling strings in the background and i think a lot of uh of an of original score is there to you know, it's, it's there to kind of accentuate the tone of whatever's happening on screen. I feel like this piece of music actually set the tone. So anytime you heard that, I mean, I know Packard was on screen, you kind of got that idea anyway, but I feel like that was kind of, I felt that was more important than what Packard was doing at any point. I don't know if you remember the music at all. For it, it doesn't stick moments, in my but, mind, to be okay. honest with you, but I, I felt like... I, I, in addition to that, Samuel L. Jackson did a really good job of just looking crazy the mm. whole time. It's a very subtle thing, but like obviously, I we've all seen loads of Samuel L. Jackson in tons of movies. But if you compare him in this film directly to how he is as Nick Fury in Marvel, it's a completely different kind of performance, right down to how just how he holds his face. Mm. Um, so I remember that more. So I, I know there are a couple of slow motion lingering shots of Packard where those pieces of music are played, but it's his face that sticks in my mind more so than how it sounded okay because i think that yeah he did a really good job of, of telling you that he was unhinged and unpleasant to be around which yes. is also a, a really strong thing for him to do as an actor because often he's very charismatic and you want more of, of that it's uh, funny that jackson he, attitude sort of thing yeah even when he's t- kind of like smiling with a happy face you find that kind of terrifying yeah in this film um I think it's kind of a marriage of the two then. Exactly. Both, both his acting and, and the music choice there. Something I think that the music doesn't do so well overall in all of the MonsterVerse, and this is a, a problem with a lot of modern movies these days, is they don't really use like melodic themes for the characters so much. So if you, th- if you think about the cl- classical stuff like the John Williams scores of like the past in Star Wars or you know, Jurassic Park or even like the Harry Potter stuff he did, you can attach certain melodic themes to characters and then when they come on screen you you know you, I, you they have a presence you know audibly i would yeah. like it if they'd done something specifically for godzilla and specifically for kong so they have like a little bit of music that like goes with them i know I that mean, godzilla does have like his theme tune from the toho movies so maybe they're gonna use that but... they did for king of the monsters mm. they did use that 
And I think they are going to focus on that more of that kind of thing. Because in King of the Monsters, actually, Mothra had her music as well. I it was so, cut. Yeah. It sort of it was drowned out a bit with a lot of yeah. other stuff, but you could hear you know her melody in there. Um, I I do think they'll focus more on more on that as it goes on. But I yeah I agree with this kind of it, you see it in video games as well. There's off you know in the early days of video games, your hardware was so limited. In order to make you know something sound good, you'd have to come up with a good melody because the sound of a beep yeah. isn't very interesting. Whereas now, you can kind of have you know a slow, long swell of strings, and that that kind of counts as music, even if it's just one note. So, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of things can kind of fall into the trap of oh, we need to you know just kind of set a mood. Yes. What sounds moody, rather than hey, we've got you know. Yeah, catchy tunes for each of these characters, essentially. Yeah, I think that's like a post temp music thing. It's a post Dark Knight trilogy thing where yes, mood definitely. supersedes melody. And I, yeah, Godzilla has his classic theme, which I'm sure they'll continue to use. But they could have given Kong like something, maybe. Mm. But maybe they will. We'll see it in the next movie. Maybe they will drum up some something. So well, they I mean, different sounds. I feel like the most notable piece was that Packard's blues, but he's dead now, so... That's the thing, isn't it, with the characters <laughs> being one-shots, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I was going to say, like, my, my favourite moment in this film was... <laughs> it's kind of kind of bad, really, but it's, it's something you never really see in movies that often. It's someone actually dying in vain. You know, you kind of hear that phrase, you know, oh, don't, you know, don't want their death to be in vain, blah, blah, blah. But you actually get to see it with Cole at the end. He's trying to sacrifice himself with the grenades yeah. to the skull crawler. And then instead, you know, it whacks him hundreds of feet away into the face of a cliff and he explodes with his grenades. And it was so funny. When I saw it in the cinema, everyone burst out laughing. <laughs> but like, And I think they were meant to. I don't know if you meant to, honestly. Are um, you? I think it's funny too. <laughs> but I don't think it's an intentional laugh. I think you're supposed to be like, wow, this is like really brutal and sad. Um, oh. that's what I think they want you to think but that isn't what I think <laughs> and also that actor I don't want to spoil the, the, the piece of media this happens in but that actor played a, a character in something else I've seen where he died in almost the exact same way oh is it a reference to that no it's not I just think it's it's an unfortunate coincidence for this, this guy <laughs> playing the role where he's just like I have an exploding death in vain situation here um, <laughs> so yeah because that's just the thing with there being so many characters is that a lot of them are there just to be killed off. Yeah, because like you're following that that guy Chapman as well. Like you feel like he's going to make it to the end because of you know, he's writing to his son. Mm-hmm. But then that doesn't happen. Um, actually, he seems his purpose was kind of strange because I feel like maybe he was the only because um, when you had like the two teams, the one that was led by Packard. You kind of, they're kind of the bad guys to some yeah. extent, and I suppose Chapman was the only one that was sort of that kind of you had any kind of sympathy with, and maybe that's why he was there at all. Uh, this is where you get in. This is where you get into your cinematic universe stuff, though, because he's writing notes to his son. He's got a little notepad. Let's say he observed something about some creature, and he writes it down, and then in, in a movie or two's time, that notepad resurfaces, and the words of this dead guy, who we've had some screen time with, impact and trigger more events later on in the cinematic universe of this series. That's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Ultimately, it, his scenes are really good, especially one where you mentioned he just he's watching Kong fight the octopus thing, the squid monster. Yeah, cool scenes. But once he's killed off by a skull crawler. It's like okay, this, yeah. just moving on, and that's that's all it is. That's that's the the recurring issue I think with the human characters in Monster versus that they don't leave an impact once they're off screen. They can be absolutely incredible on screen. Like Eliz- Elizabeth Olsen in Godzilla twenty fourteen is so good, mm. and then she's just gone, and we're not going to see her again. I wonder if that's a lack of confidence in their own franchise. I guess it costs more to contract on a star, and they seem to have this like slight bias towards casting people who are either deeply ingratiated or just about to be ingratiated into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So good luck getting Brie Larson back for another one when she's busy being Captain Marvel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you have a, a favourite moment as such? It's really the fight scene at the end. And like I mentioned before, seeing Kong use his, the, in, the resources in his environment, I think is a really good foreshadowing of what we're going to see in the next film. 
Um, yeah. We always love when we get to see the, the personality of the monsters in any way, whether it's symbolic or literal. So seeing a more literal kind of like thought process of the, the creature is really fun and you get to feel like you actually are spending time with Kong. Yeah. It's not the greatest movie ever made, but Kong in particular is the best part of it and I think that's the way it should be. So they totally succeeded. There's some cheesy bits, there's too many characters, story isn't exactly like a roller coaster of exciting events to be honest with you but i think it's the best um monsterverse movie so far because it gives you that good main character in it in its kaiju albeit kong Um, and you leave the movie thinking like yeah i saw kong doing his thing and that's what i wanted so so your favorite bit of kong was kong yes (laughs) nice (laughs) no yeah i yeah i completely agree i mean it's uh yeah it, it it takes itself a lot less seriously which is rich, really, from a guy who takes these films so seriously. But I really appreciated that. Um, I feel like they could have taken it less seriously, but maybe not gone quite as far as they, they did. I I think, to me, I think they were right on the money. I would have liked John Goodman to be a bit more sinister. Um, All but of he's, Monarch, he's with should, Monarch. Be more, should be more sinister, and they that should would maybe be, keep it a bit more... They should yeah. be considering, but they're meant to, we're meant to... We went to sympathize like them. with them every single time yeah they're such bullshit though it they're is na- they're nasty <laughs> they can get they can get away with anything yeah it's weird isn't it but yeah i think it is a positive change from the last one because it was a bit too what's the word dour i think 2014 is, yeah it, it's a detriment to the movie of just how it takes itself just a little bit too seriously the parts where it works which we, we talked about at length last time are, are great but the parts where it's not are just downright dull yeah, so. I think yeah, because this is quite this is quite pulpy. Mm-hmm. Had that you know like a a B movie with a big budget sort of vibe. I mean, I love all that. So yeah, this is uh, yeah, this, this is great. And I, I really love the excuses it. to put color on the screen when they're fighting in that like Kong graveyard. Oh, scene. like with the toxic gas, the yeah. green, and yeah. I, I mentioned last time as well, again about 2014 and, and other movies that just go too hard on the realistic grey brown battle scenes and like nah, if you can set up a few toxic smoke bombs and get some color in there like do it yeah absolutely, abso- it. absolutely yeah and like the iwis as well like mm. they're they're like body paint and stuff like that you can kind of got the the blue and the yellow which stark contrast to the rest of the yeah civilization they're in which is kind of great like all of it really popped and yeah really nice yeah a visual treat um i'm just so surprised at how easily pleased i am with bright colors <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a bad thing. <laughs> I suppose not. Um, as we normally say, could newcomers come to this? What do you reckon? Absolutely, actually. I, I think if you're going to sit down and watch the MonsterVerse franchise with somebody who's not seen any of it, you are probably better off watching 2014 first because it is a, it is the weaker movie. Mm. Um, so you kind of get out of the way and then go into Kong Skull and then you follow up with, with King of Monsters, which is also strong. Or you could do Kong first, good movie, slightly weaker Godzilla movie, and then straight into that Godzilla sequel and, and play it that way. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, you could you could definitely start with with this one, one hundred percent. But I, the other thing with this is, although it is part of the MonsterVerse, which is obviously Godzilla is really the A-lister here of the entire thing. Um, I don't think they could have done a MonsterVerse where Kong was the main character, really. But what I'm saying is that. If you're introducing somebody to Godzilla specifically, obviously, then you wouldn't start with this one. They, yeah. You would expect to move on to other Kong movies. Yeah, I suppose this is more of a question: is uh, could you get someone into the mul- into the MonsterVerse with this movie? I suppose that that's the only uh, that's the difference there. Like, mm. it's more of a newcomers to the MonsterVerse kind of question. And if you said to yeah. me, like, should this be the first Kong movie you watch? I would say probably not. Actually, watch the 1933 one first. Uh. I don't think you're missing anything by seeing this one first. Well, this one is a is a really good Kong reboot because it does something different with the character, which is really, it's good because the weakness of so many of the remakes is that they just retread the same thing over again. Mm. But I still think that seeing that cultural landmark of Kong climbing the Empire State Building and all of the other things that happen in that movie, if you want to get in- interested in Kong, watch King Kong. You know, yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's true. So, I yeah. mean, and they've hinted that. The 1933 Kong, like elements of it actually happened in this movie. So that ship that they're in, you know, where you got the the paintings on the wall of you know um, Kong and the skull crawlers and stuff like that, mm-hmm. 
that's the ship that was in the original novelization of the 33 Kong movie. So it's supposed to be like... It's supposed to be a, like... That's a failed attempt kind of thing. Yeah, so like, yeah, the actors came to the island and, and all of that. Mm. So, yeah, I suppose you're right. Start, start with 33 and then this one, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it all depends on what kind of movies you ultimately like. But if you if you're literally like, I want to know about King Kong, like, this is a great reimagining of it but you should start with the the classic yeah um okay so there's also a tie-in comic with this <gasps> film i didn't read it i <laughs> didn't read it which is fine okay. um I, think... I like listening to you talk to me about them so. okay um so this one is it's called um skull island the birth of kong so it's yeah it starts in the present day where uh, the Navy find a monarch Kevlar bag floating in the sea and it contains a dictaphone which turns out to be owned by Houston Brooks's and San Lin's son, Aaron. So okay. they, they actually ended up getting together and having a son. Mm. Um, so yeah, so then we're told a, the story through a series of flashbacks that are coming through the recorder, uh, which is pretty neat. I like that, that way of storytelling because it kind of leaves you guessing how the recorder ended up floating out into the sea in a bag um so we learned that aaron had discovered that kong and skull island existed by snooping through houston's files and he decides to mount an expedition himself to the island to find more evidence that kong exists um but he claimed that he was going to antarctica to inspect a muto fossil there oh could it be the uh that's yeah Ghidorah. Um, now where was Ghidorah? because was he in the was he in Antarctica or was he somewhere else? Because I... I think he's in Antarctica because when we discussed it, you likened it to the, the thing specifically, which also takes place yeah. in Antarctica. So I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what I assumed as well, but I couldn't remember where it was. So I didn't want to stake that claim. He's in some snowy place. Yeah. So yeah. it's probably. Could be the same. Uh, but yes, when they get to the island, they're attacked by some of these psycho. You find out the names of the creatures that are in. Um, Skull Island, actually. Mm -hmm. So there's psycho vultures. So those kind of pterodactyl things um, causes them to crash. And then the Iwis then take them back to their um, habitat. But the thing is, they can speak English now. Apparently, Marlowe taught them English. Yeah, convenient. Yeah, yeah, very convenient. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they take care of them and they give them this medicinal brew, which I suppose is like ayahuasca, you know, this kind of tribal remedy, I suppose. Um, and one of the team his name is spelled r-i-c-c-i-o and i don't know if it's if it's portuguese or spanish so it's either ricio or richo i'm gonna go with ricio just because maybe i don't know <laughs> so <laughs> ricio uh he gets hooked on it and he starts having visions of what skull island was like years prior so he, he could see like you know that the island was covered in kongs basically there were loads of them smelly Huh? Smelly. Sm <laughs> um, and how the Iwi tribe was brought there by their leader, Atenua, Atenu, Atenatua. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and they, they, uh, they had left, like, I think they were exiled from their former tribe and, oh, they, right. were, and they landed here. I think it's a bit like um, Easter Island. I think they were like Polynesian islanders and they ended up stranded most basically well, yeah, well the journey they made was like really big and i think they must have yeah maybe they were exiled and they just ended up there and yeah similar thing so effectively the comic is like a, a, a totally different movie story really it's like only very loosely connected right it's well it's not like it's a prequel where godzilla awakening comic book was literally you could read this and go straight into the movie oh as in like would you read this first and then watch the movie or is this comic book like a sequel to the movie kind of thing it's it's a sequel. I, oh, would, okay, okay. I, I would think. I don't know when it was released. Actually, I don't know if it's before or after. I would say it's a sequel, though. That's the order I would I would do it in. Hmm. Um, yeah. So this Rizio fella, uh, he ends up saying that there's going to be a communion with Kong, and that they all need to be there. Gosh. Yeah. Uh, the rest of them they they all agree to it because it's on the way back to their crash helicopter, which and which still has one of their crew there. Um, no such communion seems to occur so they radio the crew member that was in the chopper 
he manages to get it flying again. But then Riccio, who's now like completely fully whacked, he shoots a missile at the chopper so that they can't leave. And yeah, he's been having visions the whole time that show us that Kong's parents were the last two of their kind. And that mother Kong gave birth to Kong mid battle against the skull crawlers oh, and in what became the, you know, the bone graveyard from the movie. Um, and she hid him in a cave after giving birth to him and ended up dying in battle with the father shortly after. So basically, you know, Kong is Bruce Wayne of the monster verse. <laughs> um, and then these, there's a, another creature, they're called death jackals they, they appear. Um, so the whole team, they run back to the, the Iwi village uh, with Riccio, you know, raving about being judged by Kong, and it's like by by his will whether they whether they survive or not, and all of that. Um, then he blows up the jackals with the with his rocket launcher and ends up destroying part of the wall to the village, and that lets in a bunch of the mother long legs, those arachnids. Um, but then Kong appears, crushes them, and then he crush, crushes Riccio as well, just like he did with Packard. Um, and like because there's no way off the island now, Aaron has kind of accepted that he, he this is his punishment. You know, his his purpose is now to help rebuild the Iwi village. Um, and then he puts like his uh, recorder because he's been leaving all these messages. He puts it in the Kevlar bag and pushes out on a boat out to sea. And then we flash forward to the present day and see that H- Houston's at his retirement party. I assume San is dead because she's only in a photo. I don't know R-I-P. why. Yeah, it's. She really got no part whatsoever. It's really sad. Um, anyway, yeah. So I assume she's she's gone. <laughs> so they ask him what what he's going to do next, and he says he's going to take a cruise somewhere tropical. And I think they're implying that he's going to go back to Skull Island. He's going home. So, yeah, that's that's kind of it. So it's it's one of those where it kind of repeats the same events. Mm-hmm. You know, with the same set pieces, but with different characters and, and a different time period. I suppose they had to try and keep it as close to the film as possible. So it doesn't become its own kind of thing, which I don't really mind too much. But I actually think it could have benefited from being a few issues longer because it was only four issues. And they could have gone into much more depth with Aaron and his dad and, and San as well, to be honest. Um, and with the crew he was with, because I mean, some of them die as soon as they get there. And you don't really see them interact much, you know, at all. You see them react to what's going on around them rather than with each other. Mm. So it felt like they were kind of kernels of you know, stronger characterization that didn't get fully fleshed out. Um, so, yeah, I do think like maybe seven or eight issues. That would have been quite a, you know, epic companion piece, I suppose. And there's, I mean, if, if you get around to reading it, there's one thing that kind of sucked because between issue two and three, like there's something well i was gonna say there's something happened but it didn't happen so at the end of two they they run to their this old like supply drop from the previous expedition there um to fight this thing called a siren jaw and then you hear kong coming and then they gear up and they're like okay let's let's do this and you're like great i can't wait for the beginning of issue three then you read issue three and they go oh we missed him and that's it the the siren jaw is dead there's no oh. kong <laughs> That's, what the fuck happened? It was, yeah, that was quite... Uh, I don't know if they were... Maybe they had a page count to hit and ha- that would make, be too many pages. I don't know. I guess they had to cut some stuff out. I, yeah. guess, I guess they didn't want to justify... I suppose... It, no, sorry, it was rather... It was hard to justify um, sinking too much into it because essentially these, these could be seen as just tacked on extras to the films. So that's how they come across to me. Having I've not read them, obviously, but they feel like they are fan service. Like it's more of the the stuff that you may have enjoyed from the movies, rather than attempting to push forward any overall monsterverse narrative. Mm. Which is my kind of issue with it. Like I'd like to see what happened to these photographs that she took, or yeah, you know, they do they join Monarch because there's a, like a sort of a mid credits post credits scene on Skull Island where they show like, oh, are they being forced? into silence here or what's happening and yeah. that hasn't ever come to fruition in, in the movies uh, so to hear that the comic book is not about that either is just like eh, you know it's, it's, it's missed opportunities to really flesh out the characters that you probably either want to see more of or don't get to hear much yeah. about Yeah, and so like 
for example, San and Aaron. Uh, sorry, not San and Aaron, San and um, Houston. I, I really thought it was going to be about them and about their son and him getting into Monarch. And then, yeah, whatever happens. That, that's what I'm saying, you know, having a few more issues of that would have really, really been worthwhile, I think, rather than just kind of treading the same ground again. Or could um, they have even done something with like the John C. Riley character and, and filled oh, yeah. out those years? Absolutely. Yeah. Where you it's know, like, oh, he's on the island with this Japanese guy, Gunpei, and like, what, what happened? And, you know, Gunpei dies. Just do that in a comic could be more yeah. interesting than just like t- telling a new story that ostensibly doesn't really add too much, I guess. But I haven't read it myself, so I'm just assuming. Mm. There's going to be a sequel to oh. this. So there's two more books coming out for Godzilla vs. Kong. Um, there's Kingdom Kong and clever yeah and godzilla <laughs> godzilla dominion okay not as clever mm. um not as silly either no uh but yeah um houston's gonna be in that as well okay so yeah they you know actually i was in there's another comic as well godzilla aftershock so that was the tie-in for king of the monsters and houston's in that as well and they make reference to finding aaron so i guess he did go on his cruise Mm -hmm. um to find him but it's implied that he's dead i think so they found his body i think on skull island it's i couldn't really tell from the wording maybe they're leaving it vague enough that he could either be alive or dead and pick up on it later i'm not sure from the sounds of things with these comics as well where they sort of introduce new characters and also how you mentioned in last episode where um ken wantanabe's character looks more caucasian than japanese in the comic book it's doesn't sound like they're like buying like Tom Hiddleston's image rights or whatever for a comic book so that they can reuse In, those characters necessarily. Well, okay, so Godzilla Awakening, it, it wasn't actually Ken Watanabe's character. Oh, was it not? It, it was his father. Oh, right. Yeah, so like so that's why he would look different. But in Aftershock, I think they did have the rights because you could tell it was Ken Watanabe and um you know, Vera Famiga and all that kind of okay, stuff. Yeah. So I, I think they do have it, but then in this one, in in Skull Island, I like none of the characters are the same. Mm. So yeah, well, actually, I suppose the older older Houston Brooks, you could tell it kind of looked like the guy from King of the Monsters. So yeah, maybe they do. Not sure. Uh, maybe not relevant then. Yeah, um, but I mean, the, yeah, the art the art was it kind of had this. Um, it's like a semi photorealistic style you know i i personally prefer a more kind of stylized comic-y look but you know it's certainly well drawn and yeah i was never confused at any point between the characters i suppose if you're supposed to leap between literal movies to these books they want them to sort of have a visual parity that would make sense but i feel like godzilla awakening was really comic-y looking Uh okay where and the film wasn't and then vice versa with this one so this was more pulpy actiony this could have benefited from a more comic-y style. Yeah. But, pff, I mean, the splitting hairs, really. It, it, it was well-drawn, you know. Um, and the colours were fantastic, actually. It's really, really good colouring. It's all by the um, a guy called Zid. And he's going to be doing K- uh, Kingdom Kong comic okay. as well. So it's going to be kind of, you know, more of the same there. So I, yeah, I feel like they're giving it a lot of focus, which is good. I hope it stays consistent. And I do hope it fleshes out, you know, more of these characters but remains to be seen so far so Mm. yeah but overall i think it's worth a read it doesn't take too long you could read far worse things so yeah i enjoyed it good to know uh okay so i think we've talked forever now haven't we (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh okay so uh yeah i think that's about it so if you've enjoyed listening to this podcast uh please give us a rating on itunes or or share it on social media or, you know. Follow you, on Spotify. Or, yeah, all, you know. all of that. Yeah, follow on Spotify. That'd be fantastic. S- stick around, because if you like it, we'll keep doing it. Exactly. So, uh, win-win, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and all of that stuff, that, that helps us as well. So, yeah, we're, we're incredibly grateful. So, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, where can they find you, Graham? Uh, Fossil Arcade is my thing on YouTube. So, if you like retro video games and arcade games you can watch videos of that there uh i'm at ben mr hall on twitter and instagram if you want to see my pictures 
Uh, this podcast has an Instagram and it's Monster, uh, it's Monster Island Radio. Uh, and on Twitter, it's Monster Island RP. So yeah, uh, make sure to tune in again for the next one. And hopefully we'll be talking about Godzilla vs. Kong. Yeah, if it comes out this time. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, <laughs> let, maybe not. <laughs> let's, let's see. Uh, okay, so until then, everyone. Bye. Bye.